Well, uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, thanks, everyone, for, for showing up uh, this fine morning. Uh, my name is Matt Ray. I'm joined by Don O'Neill. And uh, you're here for Open Source Cloud Costs. Hopefully, you're in the right room. Uh, so a quick introduction of who we are, uh, Don. Uh, I'm a program lead for Standardize and Enforce for MuleSec, uh, MuleSoft, MuleTrust. There's a bunch of different ways that we call it. It's a governance org. And where do you work? I mean, where is MuleSoft part of? Uh, MuleSoft is part of Salesforce. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you're also the, the co-lead of the Seattle... Yep, Seattle Coffee Ops, uh, Dev DevOps SRE meetup, in case you're interested. We're all virtual right now. Uh, see me afterwards. Happy yeah. to hook you up. Uh, my name is Matt Ray. I'm the Open Cross Community Manager. Uh, I'm not local to Seattle. I'm actually based out of uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, I have a podcast called the Software Defined Talk, and uh, I do open source stuff. So, um, so let's get into it. Uh, you know, Kubernetes is, is a very complex mechanism. I mean. It can do a lot of amazing things, but underneath the covers, there's a lot going on. And you know, as you get more into it, more complexity gets exposed. And keeping track of how to operate it efficient, efficiently is, is a real problem. And so OpenCost is here to help you keep track of the cost of what you're doing. Um, so OpenCost is a, a CNCF project. Um, we are completely open source, Apache licensed. And it started as focused on Kubernetes cost monitoring. So uh, initially, it was a specification. We'll talk about the specification here in a little bit. Uh, but it's also an implementation of how to monitor your cloud cost. Uh, like I said, we started with Kubernetes, but we've moved into general cloud costs and we're moving into carbon costs and SaaS costs as well. So, um, and if you are involved in the FinOps space, uh, OpenCost is a FinOps certified solution. So you can learn more about it at opencost.io, uh, and there's our, our GitHub. Um, but uh, let's start with the OpenCost specification. So Kubernetes workloads are transient. You know, sometimes you have things that might be a batch job the last 10 minutes. You might have things that are always running. Uh, you might have you know, one team that runs a single Kubernetes cluster and they have an application, or you might have you know, 5,000 teams across multiple Kubernetes clusters, and you know, they might be reusing namespaces or tags to keep track of their applications and workloads. Um, and so there's a lot of variation in how your Kubernetes workloads are running on top of Kubernetes. You know, they might be completely ephemeral, they might not be. Um, but what we want to do is figure out how to measure who's responsible for, you know, what is running and how much does it cost? You know, because at the end of the day, unfortunately, um, the cloud offerings aren't free. And so what, uh, what OpenCost helps you keep track of is the management fees. You know, when you're using something like uh, an EKS or uh, an AKS, you know, there's generally a management fee just to run your cluster. You know, the overhead of, of running your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, but a lot of the cost, uh, if, if you're familiar with your AWS bill and you're, you're running a lot of uh, Kubernetes workloads, you're like, all right, everything will be my EKS bill, right? Wrong. Uh, EKS is going to be like, a $20 a month management fee, and you're like, but I have 5,000 nodes in my cluster, you know, where is that? It's hidden in EC2 um, and other places. And so what we wanna help you do is keep track of your Kubernetes costs, uh, no matter where they are in the stack. And so uh, we're gonna look into, um, you know, EC2 or, uh, you know, what if you're on a GKE or, you know, one of the other clouds, we'll look, find the cost of your compute, find the cost of uh, persistent volumes, you know, things that you're using for storage, um, attached disk, load balancers, and, you know, track network ingress, egress. Um, and so OpenCost started as a specification. Um, initially, OpenCost was the open source engine uh, for the company KubeCost. Uh, KubeCost contributed OpenCost to the CNCF in June of uh, 2022. And you know, before they contributed the code base, they had been working on a specification uh, with AWS, with GCP, with uh, Red Hat, with uh, you know, a couple of other organizations about how we think about how to split up these costs. You know, who who's responsible for what? Um, how do you measure how much CPU is used? You know, how much CPU does your workload cost? Is it the request? Is it the limits? Is it actual usage? How do you share? Um, how do you split shared cost? Uh, all those things kind of went into the specification and discuss, like, here are optimal ways of, of splitting those up. Um, and then 
given what's on the left, what is measured, CPU, memory, GPU, uh, how you can look at those things and aggregate them on the right. Uh, and so on the right is all the things that are, exist inside Kubernetes that you can split up your views inside of OpenCost. Um, and of course, you can do multi-aggregation. So you can say, I want to see all pods by namespace or you know, all uh, deploy deployments by cluster, you know, things like that, if, uh, if that's how you need to keep track of things. Uh, so what is monitored? Um, like I said, initially, OpenCost started with Kubernetes cost. Uh, keeping track of, uh, initially, it was the three, uh, the three main cloud providers and on-premises, uh, but recently we added official support for Oracle Cloud Infrastructure. Uh, there's also support for um, uh, AliCloud, uh, Aliun, if, if uh, you're so inclined, uh, Scaleway, um, uh, Linode is working on some support. Uh, so it's not too difficult to add new Kubernetes cloud providers, uh, but recently we've gotten into cloud costs. And so if you're familiar with the cloud cost space, this is hard. Um, your AWS bill, for example, I've seen organizations that are spitting out tens of terabytes of billing data a day. You know, just, you know, hey, here's how much your billing data is. And so there are a lot of people who have written custom solutions. They've written little scripts that, that go and parse this stuff and, and read through it. Um, but open cost is open source and uh, has a community around it and, and you know, relatively supported. So if you need to process your cost and usage reports for AWS, for, uh, for Azure, for GCP, for, uh, for Oracle, uh, if you're involved in the FinOps Focus program, um, OpenCost is one of the only tools that is you know, actively supporting those uh, integrations. So um, what we do in OpenCost is we actually process the curve. We start reading it. It usually shows up 24, 48 hours later after you actually start consuming those resources because you know they're tallying them up and keeping track of them and publishing them to like an S3 bucket and processing them, we'll put that behind an API. So you can actually go and, and run queries against your cur. I want to see um, you know, how much uh, load balancer I had, you know, how much uh, elastic load balancer was used from this period of time or, or things like that. Um, so that's, that's actually kind of a hidden feature. I mean, it's not hidden, but it's, it's a relatively new feature that uh, I don't think enough organizations are aware of that like, hey, this is open source now and, and you know, fairly well supported. Uh, we at KubeCon EU about uh, two, three weeks ago, we announced carbon costs. Um, the current release is 1.109. Carbon costs are in the main branch. Uh, develop is what we call our, our main branch. Um, so we are actually starting to track carbon cost footprints. So if you are in an organization, um, especially in Europe, that needs to keep track of carbon usage for your, uh, for your workloads. Um, we're working with the Cloud Carbon Footprint Project to actually track down to the node level, which OpenCost then splits into you know, pods, namespaces, whatever. Um, so you can actually track the carbon footprint of your Kubernetes workloads. Uh, and then also coming in the 1.110 release, uh, we've introduced a new cost plugins model where you can bring in new cost providers. So if you have SaaSes or uh, you know, other billing sources, you know, maybe you just have a, a, an SRE group that bills you chargeback. You, know, you could actually put them into the model and split up your SRE chargeback across, uh, across your namespaces, for example. Uh, and Datadog is our first reference example, and, and that's coming in the 1.110 release. So now that you know what's, what's monitored and kind of general idea of what OpenCost is doing, let's talk about how MuleSoft is using it. Yeah, so as you might imagine, I'm the MuleSoft representative. And uh, so OpenCost in particular for us, um, we're obviously approaching it from an end user's perspective. Uh, when we first started our journey into understanding our EKS costs, uh, we're all in, in AWS and in EKS, um, the, the cloud, the cur was not yet available to us, um, as you can probably tell. So we still needed the data, and we still wanted to already like pull everything in that we could. Um, the kind of thing that we've got going on really is we have a bunch of different service teams, and we want to do, to Matt's point, is uh, understand the chargeback for them, really. Um, and so I'd like to speak with you a little bit about what our perspective is. Yeah, thanks. So. As Matt alluded to, Kubernetes, Kubernetes is the great mystery, right? And as you can probably imagine, understanding what's happening inside your Kubernetes cluster at a cost level is kind of difficult. 
So we needed to figure out what that looked like. And, and, and what did that look like? How many, like roughly how many teams are we talking about? Sure, uh, we have somewhere in the neighborhood of about 1,000 engineers, 25, 30 different service teams running tons of different products. Almost everything is entirely in Kubernetes and it attaches to other things outside of Kubernetes. So databases, uh, you know, all the types of things you can imagine. Yeah. So as we touched about touched on CUR, cost and usage report, EKS, Elastic Kubernetes Service, just a few things that I'm bringing up here just to make sure everybody understands what they are. So EKS is great. Um, you get a cost. The CUR is great because you get a cost for your Kubernetes cluster. Great. It costs all up, say, 10 grand. Well, is that enough to understand what's really happening? Probably not. So we needed a way to really kind of dive in and figure out per service team what we were spending. Um, uh, we wanted to also look at efficiency and usage and be able to do uh, kickoff cost optimization projects or uh, efficiency projects, you know, that sort of thing. And so open cost. We uh, took a look at a couple of different things. We looked at cube cost. We looked at cloud health. And cloud health in particular um, didn't really meet our needs because it couldn't really introspect for us the way that we wanted to. Um, cube cost, while great, we were looking at it from a AWS hosted cube cost perspective. They wanted to charge us money. <laughs> and since part of the journey and part of the cost optimization was to not spend a bunch of money, we said, well, what about open cost? Yeah. And, and, and to be fair, uh, KubeCost is one of the primary engineering teams behind OpenCost. Uh, they do have a free tier. Uh, Salesforce is a little bit larger than the free tier. <laughs> yeah, a little bit larger. At, at minimum, we have five types of clusters and, you know, the, all, all the associated costs with it. So we, we were way outside the KubeCost <laughs> free tier. It just wasn't going to work. Yeah. Um, so let's talk a little bit about how we kind of decided to build this. And again, a lot of this is very specific to our particular use case, as Matt is going to talk about a little bit later. There are multiple ways that you can use open cost and the way that you architect it. Art architect it. Ours in particular kind of looks like this. You've got open cost on the left inside your Kubernetes cluster, and it talks to a Prometheus uh, endpoint. It then ships the data out via CSV to a data lake and we have our data lake uh, absorb all the data, and then we basically crunch it and create dashboards out of that. And, and in the typical open cost deployment, you deploy open cost as uh, you know, a deployment inside your uh, Kubernetes cluster. Um, it depends on Prometheus as its data store. So open cost actually goes, queries the cloud APIs, talks to Kubernetes APIs, and gathers up that data, and then, um, Require, Prometheus actually scrapes it, stores that data for you, and then when you have queries against the OpenCost API, OpenCost is then going back to Prometheus and saying, hey, uh, you know, do this join, you know, make this query for me. Uh, so Prometheus acts as kind of the local data store for OpenCost. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and in our particular case, we didn't actually have Prometheus, which is probably a little surprising to some of you. Um, so I ended up having to bring Prometheus along with it. Um, I might touch on that a little bit later. Um, this is a little bit about how we did it. Um, think of this as like one particular instance or a stamp of how we did it. Uh, we deployed it into its own namespace called Oversight. That's the team that basically, it's sort of a bundled up team of a couple of teams. Uh, we deployed it in all the different clusters and in all the different flavors of Kubernetes. And what I mean by multiple flavors is some we have as are shared and some are per application depending on their size due to scale, right? Um, so it writes daily to a CSV file, um, to an S3 bucket. Um, we use a seven day rolling window and the data lake consumes the CSV refreshing the reports. Uh, we found this is working pretty well. And uh, so, yeah. Did you have some questions? Oh, uh, you went back. Yeah, I did go back. I went to uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, deployed in all clusters, all flavors, Kubernetes, uh, you know, OpenCost supports, you know, the current re supported releases of Kubernetes. Uh, there are a couple of API endpoints that uh, we talk to that, you know, that, so you need to have supported versions of Kubernetes. Uh, but if you go back uh, to older releases, 
we, we can go back pretty far back in time. Um, and then the, luckily for us, yeah, <laughs> uh, for the, the CSV exports, um, that feature was actually contributed by Microsoft. Um, so they, they, uh, you know, wanted to make it easier for other tools to consume this, uh, uh, this data. And, uh, you know, in their, in their, uh, announcement, they made sure to let you know that you can open it in Excel. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, if you want. <laughs> Uh, because we already had a data lake that has a lot of the AWS assets, it made a lot of sense for us to just absorb the CSV and add it as another table that we could cross-join against. It made tons and tons of sense. It made our reporting really, really easy. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some learning lessons that I learned along the way. Um, it, it, when I started, I didn't think I needed Prometheus because I thought my cluster had it. Well, it turns out it didn't. So. Make sure you have a Prometheus <laughs> endpoint available. Kind of a key learning here. It's, it's the number for one thing in the installation <laughs> docs. Yep. I thought I was all hunky-dory. I installed it locally, and then nothing was happening. I was getting these 503 errors. I'm like, what's going on? And yeah. I was like, oh, I'm not actually got any data to pull to, oh. Yeah, and then another common uh, question about Prometheus and open cost is, is people you know, say, hey, um, yeah, the, we, we just use the default Prometheus from the Prometheus Community Helm chart, and, uh, and then we have an extra scrape config for open cost. Um, and you know, just tell people, just, just install this. And then, of course, you know, we get kind of two variants of that. People have, oh, I've got my own P Prometheus, and then they skip the extra scrape config part. Um, or they'll say, well, uh, how come I only have 15 days of data, uh, which that's the default that comes from the Prometheus uh, community helm chart. You can make it longer, um, but heads up, Prometheus is not meant to be a long-term data store. Um, and we don't actually intend for you to use it that way either, uh, even though uh, you know, our API and UI will let you make those sorts of queries. Um, we tend to see people start to run into bottlenecks if they have about 100 nodes of data. Um, because every, every minute it's collecting data, pushing it to Prometheus, and then you'll try to run a query of like, hey, show me, you know, the last 10 days of namespace for 100 nodes. And by the way, this thing had only been allocated like two gigs of RAM and, you know, it, it kind of chokes. So you can tune it, but it's not really meant to be your long-term data store. Yeah, ask me how I know about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so bringing your own Prometheus, you're probably going to need to tune this memory and CPU. Yeah, and you can use point. other Prometheus compatible databases. Um, you know, there's uh, Microsoft embeds open cost in their cost and their uh, AKS billing dashboard. And so uh, you can go and just turn that feature on and then drill down into everything about your Kubernetes usage on AKS. Um, they're actually doing some work with Victoria Metrics, um, which they've gotten good uh, results with. Uh, Thanos, Mimir, um, Cortex, you know, those are all uh, alternate uh, endpoints you can use. But also you can push, you can do like a, an export of your data to forward to a larger, you know, Cortex, Mimir, Thanos, you know, kind of database outside of your cluster. So you can do aggregation somewhere else. Yeah, and uh, if you want to do some custom sort of selection of what data you bring in, um, your choice probably is going to be the Parquet Explorer. You can push the era to uh, Redshift or Athena, if you like. Yeah, yeah, and that was contributed by another community uh, member who, you know, they are running similar setup, similar scale, but uh, instead of having a data lake, they use Athena and they push uh, their their open cost data via a Parquet export into um, Athena, and then they use Athena to query their uh, AWS cur. And one last thing that we. Uh we decided when we talk, talk, thought about like how do we compute the costs, we were going to compute the costs and the cost savings that you might get from an enterprise data a savings plan or any of those types of discounts. We decided that we were going to do that after we absorbed the raw data. Uh, just so you know, you can do your own rate sheet if you like. Yeah, yeah, and that's, that's an important thing to note is, is open cost does not currently do what we call reconciliation. Uh, when OpenCost records the cost of your Kubernetes workloads, it's using the on-demand list pricing. So if you're on AWS, it goes to the, the pricing for your availability zone and says, you know, what's the cost of an M3 extra large, you know, with you know, fast storage or whatever. It says, oh, that's 23 cents an hour. So it's recording that 23 cents an hour, you know, every every minute to, the, you know, your the nodes that are, are deployed in your cluster. Um, 
But turns out you're a large organization, like Salesforce, who has some discounts uh, or some sustained usage rates or reserved instances. Um, those are not calculated by open cost uh, because your bill shows up 24, 48 hours later and we would need to query the bill and update those numbers retroactively and probably a, a second database. Um, KubeCost does that. We have access to all that data. It's potentially on the roadmap, but it's a lot of work. And so if, uh, if you're interested in reconciliation, um, you can do it yourself, like the other organization who did the Parquet exports, they're doing their own reconciliation. Um, another uh, large user is uh, uh, Grafana Labs. They do their own reconciliation, or actually they don't care about it, but, um, but you can bring you know, your own pricing, uh, you can do your own reconciliation. Um, you have all the data, it's just we don't do that for you yet. Or you, know, you can use KubeCost free, uh, which, which will do that. Um, and then if you're doing on-premises, uh, we have a default pricing uh, that we provide that's based off uh, GCP pricing, but you can also just upload your own pricing. So if you have an on-premises installation or you're in uh, an MSP inside of AWS and you don't want your actual, you know, you don't want the actual billing exposed, you want your MSP pricing exposed, um, you can do that as well. So you can do uh, your own rate sheet. So yeah, that's a little bit about our journey and I'd be happy to answer questions afterwards if you'd like. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, uh, there are kind of, kind of the three main ways to run open cost. Um, the, the primary is you know, the, the default, uh, which is, hey, create an open cost namespace, install Prometheus, um, just use the default, it, it's perfectly fine. And uh, you know, go do configure your various permissions, which is kind of sometimes a rough spot depending on how your IAM is configured or you know, how your Azure subscriptions are based. Do you have access to the, all the billing? That can be kind of difficult, um, but you know, we've got a lot of documentation and alternate documentation sources uh, for working through cloud configuration. Configure your Helm chart accordingly. You know, hey, here's the secrets, here are my passwords, you know, here's how I get access to my billing data, uh, and just install with the Helm chart. You know, it's, it's two, two containers. Uh, one is the UI, which you can turn off, and the other is the cost model, which is gathering that data. And then Prometheus is its own handful of containers. Uh, that's the default installation. Each cloud has kind of the same instruction flow, just templated for you know, GCP versus Azure versus on-prem. Um, that's what most people should be using. Uh, alternately, uh, you can run it in Docker. Uh, with Docker, you're not going to have any Kubernetes costs, obviously, because you're in Docker, uh, but you have access to that full cost and usage report. So if you wanted an API on top of your bill, um, that's a great way to, to get access to that. You can also run the UI inside of Docker. So if, for example, um, you know, we were kind of talking through this yesterday, they, that uh, MuleSoft isn't using the UI, but Maybe you don't want to run the UI, but occasionally you just throw up a, a Docker, point it at the UI, and say, hey, if you wanted to look, here it is. Turn that off most of the time. Um, Turns out that executives like pretty gra graphs. UI gives you pretty graphs. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody loves pretty graphs. Um, and then uh, within the Prometheus community Helm charts, uh, there is a Prometheus open cost exporter, which is just pr open cost running as a prom exporter. So you know it's not going to have any long-term storage, but if you just want to scrape that Kubernetes data, uh, that's available to you. Uh, you know, we mentioned the UI. It's not super pretty, but it's good enough. Um, it pretty much just exposes what's in the basic API. Um, allows you to, you know, run uh, aggregations. Uh, you know, we call them breakdowns in the UI, but it's, hey, I want to see things by pod, by namespace. I want to do a custom date range of, you know, the last 48 hours, or I want to see what was happening Tuesday between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. You know, that, that sort of stuff. Uh, and you know, cloud costs are pretty much the same thing. Uh, it's fine, yeah. If uh, if you are a uh, React developer and you have an itch for open source, hit me up. It does work. <laughs> uh, has no authentication. Don't run it publicly facing because the node dependencies are three years out of date. Um, but anyway, uh, so the, the the data is what's really important. And so uh, we have an API. 
Um, you know, it, there is a lot of stuff that's not fully documented in the API yet, but the basics of allocation, which is your Kubernetes cost, you know, how you see those split up, uh, that's in there. The cloud costs are in there, lets you run queries against it. And then there's some other uh, APIs that aren't fully documented, but, you know, if you like exploring Go, uh, it's in there. But what the UI uses is, is in there. Um, we have a backstage plugin. Unfortunately, about two weeks ago, uh, it got broken by an update in their dependencies. Again, if you're a React developer, hit me up. <laughs> uh, but the, the Backstage plugin is essentially the UI just embedded inside Backstage. Uh, if you are a Backstage user um, and you'd like more, uh, you know, there is a KubeCost exporter that's totally different that you know, we could, uh, we could uh, you know, update to use OpenCost. Um, there's CSV export. Uh, right now, the default for CSV exports is just once a day, it drops into a bucket, a file system, you know, what have you. Uh, but, um, you know, there are some PRs open to, to update uh, your options with that. Uh, we recently added a new repository for Grafana dashboards. Uh, there is an example Grafana dashboard. We're putting it into its own repository to get it fleshed out more, so, so maybe people do a little more uh, interesting things with it. Uh, there is a CLI, kubectl cost, that pretty much runs the API queries for you and dumps them into nice you know, CLI output. Um, as we mentioned, there's an open cost Parquet exporter uh, that does Parquet exports. What more could you ask for? Mm -hmm. uh, you can access Prometheus directly if, if you're so inclined. And uh, you know, there's the Prometheus open cost exporter and the web UI. Um, OpenCost, it's a CNCF project. It's all up on GitHub. Uh, we, today, we have six repositories. We might have seven in two weeks. We're probably going to move the UI out of OpenCost into its own repository. Uh, but OpenCost, OpenCost is the, is the, main, is the main repo. Uh, it's where most of the action happens. But you know, the other pieces, if you're so inclined, are there. Uh, the plugins, again, are new. If there's a data source you'd like to add, um, hit me up, and, and we can talk about uh, you know, the, the plugins documentation. There's a PR to merge uh, some right now. And, and the website is also most of the documentation. So get involved. Uh, OpenCost.io is our website. A, a lot of the conversations are happening in Slack. We're in the CNCF Slack channel, uh, or CNCF Slack, whatever they call it, uh, pound OpenCost. And um, we have fortnightly community meetings every two weeks, Thursday, 1 p.m. Pacific. Uh, this week's is probably going to be canceled because I'm here and flying home, and I'm <laughs> uh, probably canceling this week's. Um, but uh, uh, we do have an agenda that is a Google Doc maintained by the CNCF, so we keep track of what it is, and the recordings of the meetings get dumped onto YouTube, um, which I should add to our social media. Uh, there's the social media things. Thank you. Any questions? I'm happy to come around with the mic if you want to speak. Shocked. Don't be shy. Yes. So on your uh, UI picture, you had, uh, you're not going to need the mic. <laughs> well, we'd like to see I'll throw in there. No, not a problem. Um, what does efficiency mean? Because I saw 285% uh, yeah, and the other ones were much lower. That's what I was curious about. Uh, yes. So uh, efficiency is um, when you have a node allocated, uh, you know, you have a, say, you have a five node cluster and maybe you're not running a full five nodes worth of Kubernetes workloads. Usually you're not. And um, efficiency is pretty much how much bin packed those clusters are. Um, and then efficiency per like a namespace would be, uh, well, you've got requests and limits on your actual containers uh, about you know, what you'd like for them to be using. It's how efficient they are with what they were requesting. Um, so the specification actually breaks down into how efficiency is calculated. Uh, and then in the 110 release, there's going to be another column called, or another row called idle, uh, which is just that unused overhead. So usually when it comes to um, optimizing your Kubernetes workloads, the first thing you look at is efficiency and idle, and you're like, hey, I've got five nodes allocated, and I'm using maybe one node of compute. Uh, and so you can you know, look at efficiency for GPU, for memory, for CPU, uh, and play with those numbers. I mean, OpenCost is... Uh, it doesn't do recommendations and auto-scaling and stuff, but it's used by other tools that do. And so um, efficiency is, is a place to start, for sure. And you, you might have requirements like, yeah, I know we have wasted space, but we have HA requirements or you know, what have you. 
but that's what efficiency is about. Just one quick note about the efficiency. My team, when we first lit this up and we looked at one of our dev clusters, it was really interesting to see the efficiency number because you can go highly positive, like 238% efficient, yeah. which is really a testament to getting your tuning right. So you can use that as a measure to tune with to get your maximum efficiency. The other thing I'd point out is that you can also use that as sort of a gamified approach with service teams to say, hey, look at this other team who is 238% efficient. Don't you want to make that goal? <laughs> Yeah, but it also has the negative of like, oh, well, we only requested this much, but we actually needed this much. And we look efficient because we're, you know, only, you know, we're always using more than we requested, but that was free and that could bite you eventually. But yeah, question, the w w sort of a related to the efficiency is it, can we use that to identify unused, like, like you talk about in dev? stuff that you deploy, the teams are deploying, and then just forgot about? Yes. Um, I'm just you know, kind of thinking in my head how, how, uh, how to track that. Um, there are definitely recommendation tools that, you know, that's usually the first thing, is look for unused resources. Yeah. I don't know how you would identify it from efficiency. Do you... Well, and actually, and one follow-up. Then the, the other thing is you mentioned that there's also namespace tracking. So then we can say, like, all right, this team has blah, 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 this team. Yeah, yeah. I mean, any, any, pretty much any primitive inside of Kubernetes you can run a query for. So you want to aggregate by namespace or, you know, show me all the jobs, you know, or whatever, whatever it is inside of Kubernetes, you can totally get these, you know, these views, so you can see, you know, CPU and RAM by namespace or cost of, of those things. Yeah, the, the thing that we had going on was um, we wanted to understand by namespace the cost in the namespace, and then there's a shared namespace for any of the shared Kubernetes clusters, and so we wanted to then split out that cost across all of it. Um, to speak to, like, identifying the idle pieces, there's definitely some elements that you can use with tagging, with resource usage from the cur itself. So you could... And that's where our data lake comes in. It's really important for us to understand, hey, is this idle? How many are there? You know, is it efficient? Is it not? Yeah, this one looks like it's abandoned. Usually we can tell by the tags whether or not there are any tags, and that's usually a good indicator for us. Question in the back? for Docker and uh, to deploy in Kubernetes. But I've been thinking of trying to jump over that to Knative and serverless, rather than trying to figure out all this stuff and just kind of go directly to something that's gonna manage it for me where I don't have to become a Kubernetes specialist. You know, like we've got probably 50 VPSs right now and we're gonna try and migrate. And so is this a better idea than going to Knative or? Um, I, you know, so we don't current, we don't really track uh, Knative costs. Are you you're, you're saying you wanted to use Knative as just a, a cost aggregate uh, to like to optimize our where we can you know run our uh, yeah um, I, I think I, I'm not sure like it's an apples and oranges kind of conversation. Um, we could just tell you how much your workloads are costing. Um, we're not really, we're not really optimizing anything for you. So you could run experiments to see, like, hey, does this make more sense running in a container? Does it make more sense doing, you know, Knative or, or even Wasm or something like that? Um, yeah. Yeah, I could definitely highly recommend running experiments. 